as you know, I wrote um, uh, this, uh, The Founders of Paradise uh, 20 years ago, okay, and um, it was inspired, I think, by a meeting in Russia in 82 with uh, Yuri Artsutanov, the um, inventor of the space, uh, of the space elevator, a charming, charming man, I don't know if he's still around. Now, um, you know, one of the problems with the space elevator, though, and I don't know quite how we're going to solve this, is debris. And all the satellites, thousands of them now, you know, in all the way up to the stationary orbit. So that's going to be a major problem, which may make the space elevator impractical. You know, don't send things up unless we can get them down again or, um, or, or destroy them. Make, well, no, you can't destroy them because even the smallest bit of debris would be... Uh, Maybe we have to have a kind of big, a big broom sweeper moving through space, and you know, strong enough to absorb the impact of all the smaller bits and keep sweeping, sweeping space. I am happy that people are taking it, you know, more and more seriously, and I do think that it may be the way to space. And the economics are fantastic. It only costs a few hundred dollars of electrical energy to take a human being up to the stationary orbit. And of course, you get it all back on the way down. So I've been saying for years that one day the chief cost of space tourism uh, will be for catering and in-flight movies. In an ordinary electric elevator, you know, you come down, you feed electricity back into the system. And it's an almost, a, uh, you know, some, probably a 90% efficiency. When I recorded The Fountains of Paradise, back, oh, 20 years ago, or for Cademan. The cover note and the drawing were provided by the great engineer architect, Buckminster Fuller. Now, recently they discovered the material C60, carbon 60, the strongest material known, or even possible perhaps, which would make the space elevator practical. And here's the coincidence, it's been named Buckminster Fullerene. Of course, he never lived to see that. If space tourism does develop, I can see it's getting started in about 10 years' time, and that'll be a great incentive you know, for such projects. We build about um, 10 years after everybody stops laughing. Well, I think they have stopped laughing. I'm 86 now, so in 20 years' time, I'll be only 106. So uh, maybe I will see it. Yeah, you might say tourism is, is rather trivial. But whole areas of science and technology will be opened up. Uh, astronomy is an obvious one, but uh, many other areas, sort of zero gravity, materials processing, uh, you know, and probably things that we haven't even thought of when we can experiment on a large scale in a complete vacuum. If one had asked an intelligent fish, what do you think we could be able to, you'll be able to do when we move out into this new element, the air? Well, there are various consortia being set up now in the United States and in, the, and in England and uh, Britain and elsewhere, I'm sure, uh, to do this sort of independently of governments. Um, the sort of thing that happened in a way, I guess, in, in civil aviation. The laying of the first transatlantic telegraph cable, that was the sort of Victorian equivalent, uh, you know, of the conquest of space. In fact, it was a kind of conquest of space when the telegraph cable started to, you know, to, to link the whole world. And I'm now quite convinced that Mars is infested with life. And the Mars orbiter photographs show huge areas of vegetation. I don't think there's any doubt anymore on that. Cold fusion, or whatever it is. It may not, it's not cold, it's not fusion. It may be tepid fission or something. But there's something going on there. Um, I mean, when Pons and Fleischmann announced, uh, you know, a decade ago that they detected uh, low energy nuclear reactions or whatever. Everybody laughs them out of court. But now a number of reputable groups have succeeded in generating small amounts of energy which are, are not easy to account for. So I think there is something there. Now it may be a merely a laboratory curiosity uh, or it may be the beginning of a new industry, of a, in fact of a new age. Oh, incidentally, I just uh, been informed of something which has pleased me very much, going back to 1951, that um, Dr. Von Braun used my book, The Exploration of Space, uh, to convince President Kennedy 
that uh, it was possible to go to the moon. So I feel rather proud of that. I've only recently discovered it. I mean, there are some things that are probably best done, you know, by private industry, and then may say then it may then become big and have to be taken over or at least controlled, regulated. You know, um, broadcasting is a good example. You know, that was mostly, you know, hams, and, and then of course the FCC had to be invented, and <laughs> that's that's a good example. There are two spots in the Earth's gravitational field where the uh, 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 space elevator would be more stable. And one that does happen to be you know, quite near, near uh, Sri Lanka. But there are pretty good arguments for putting it at sea, particularly if anything goes wrong with the bits of fall down in the ocean. If any one country, for example, got a space elevator, and all the others would be clients and have to you know, go there, uh, so there has to be some international agreements established, and the sooner the better. I would like to see the space elevators all around the Earth. In fact, I'm not I'm half serious, but I think one day the Earth may have an orbital ring around it, out in the station orbit. Not enough people know what's going on in space. That may be true. We do take it for granted. I mean, we're using space right now for the communication satellite. And um, it might be a very good idea to have a little task force looking around all the professions and saying these people would be helped by a space elevator. You know, and uh, I mean, the, the medical profession is an obvious one. All sorts, and I'm sure all sorts of things could be done in space. I mentioned the analogy, you know, no intelligent fish could even imagine fire. And the best advice I've ever heard applies to everything is don't panic.